But I think fundamentally the readers have got to engage with the character because it's the, the, char the, the plot is what's happening. The characters are why it matters. Hello, friends. My name is Steve, and I'm here today with author Tim Hardy. Tim, how are you doing this evening? Yeah, doing, doing great. Thanks, Steve. How are you? I'm pretty good. It's evening for you and morning for me. So we were just talking about that. <laughs> and uh, right before we went on, we were, we were talking about um, it's weird to talk about books and, and entertainment when so many heavy, heavy things are going on. But yeah, um, and about how, you know, I think people need a break from time to time, whether it's uh, world events or you just trouble in your own life or your own mental health sometimes just to get a breather so thanks for taking the time yeah no problem yeah thanks for having me on yeah so uh what can you tell us about uh brotherhood of the eagle um okay so brotherhood of the eagle i'd probably describe it as dark fantasy um but it does i think a lot of this stuff gets lumped together in grim dark a, a lot these days but i think it's probably more dark fantasy um in terms of overall overall tone um so it starts with the first book um, hall of bones which is uh, my my debut novel that came out in november 2020 that, that is the one yes <laughs> perfect product placement there um so that came out in november uh, 2020 um and i basically i describe the series as um it, it's a bit i suppose game of thrones is quite a big influence in terms of my reading and it, it seeped into the, the book there's no two ways about it so i think it does a start it's a bit like game of thrones but mashed together with the TV show The Vikings, if you're familiar with that. Right. So it kind of draws a, a couple of a couple of influences in terms of giving it its overall overall theme. Uh, and then, yeah, it's um book series. So I've, I've released the the sequel um, to All of Bones, Sundered Souls, that came out in 2021. I should probably wave that in front of the camera as well, as <laughs> completeness. So um, that was released, um, I think, at the summertime. I can't quite remember when now. Uh, july or august i think it was um so that's the, that's the sequel that's out now and i'm hoping to release a third book in the series um which we called lost gods at some point probably the back end of 2022 so yeah the, the series is well underway basically nice is it a trilogy or do you have it planned out it, it's an uncontrolled trilogy it's become four <laughs> books so um i, I kind of um, yeah, I wouldn't say lost control of my material, although I, I have slightly lost control of my material. It's uh, it's more a case of think more ideas came to me. So I had an original plot structure, uh, but now I need a fourth book to basically complete the arc but to my satisfaction, really. So, uh, yeah, four book series. Ideally, like to get that um, that fourth book released in 2023. I feel like I'm a one book a year kind of author, so I want to kind of keep to that that schedule, really. But yeah, two out of four so far. Yes. And you mentioned Game of Thrones and, you know, being a big influence on you as you were writing, because when, whenever I sit down to write or whenever I sit down to do anything creative, I always end up copying something else that's influenced me because that's kind of my inspiration. So in what ways was that ever a concern for you to to kind of steer to not be too close? And sometimes I like for the YouTube channel, I do things that other creators do without really thinking about it. But when I look at it, so I, I did this exact same thing this person did just because I enjoyed what, what they did and I don't really think about it so was it was that was that ever a concern for you to not be too close to what's uh, what's inspired you um I'm not too bothered about that because I think in many ways fantasy is, is a genre that sort of builds on what's gone before mm. so you're always going to get um I think influences from um what you've read and I think it's more about actually giving it a giving it a fresh take so although I've mentioned the, the Game of Thrones and the Vikings in terms of the Brotherhood of the Eagle series, actually, I think the, the, the single biggest influence in terms of when I started that book is actually probably Robin Hobbs' um, mm -hmm. Assassin's Farseer series, if you're familiar with, with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, to be honest, I, I probably, I, looking back, I think I borrowed quite a lot of ideas from that, probably more than I intended to when I set out. But I, mm -hmm. the, the kind of political feel, for example, that Hall of Bones it begins with, certainly, that that's very much drawn from... Robin Hobb and, and Farseer. Um, and yeah, I, I suppose with, with fantasy, often, you, you know, we use a lot of tropes that people are familiar with and lots of ideas and concepts come up and get, get reused. And it's mm -hmm. about more, I think, melding those ideas to your voice, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of readers actually go into fantasy because they, they, they want to be surprised, but they also want to read something that feels familiar. You know, we talked again about escapism and, uh, you know, yeah, lots of people like reading stuff that kind of maybe wrong foots and all that. They have no idea what's going to happen next. But if you look at most genre fiction of all 
archetypes, you kind of know what you're going to get with each individual book. And I think that does apply to fantasy. And it's about kind of leaning on those conventions, but then also trying to do something a little bit different with it at the same time so that the reader gets something new out of the experience whilst also sort of getting that escapism and that kind of fantasy hit they're looking for, really. Yeah, that's a good point. And I love the covers for the book. The cover, both of the covers are just gorgeous. I, I mean, they're very eye-catching. They just look cool. Uh, how Thank did the you. covers come to be? Um, well, I've got no artistic ability whatsoever. <laughs> so um, that they didn't come to be by me creating um, any of them. And uh, I, I must admit, I was kind of looking at sort of, I start again with self-publishing. You've got to kind of work out everything. And I don't, I didn't fully appreciate quite how much of everything you've got to do. It really is literally everything. Um, <laughs> so I knew I needed to find a cover artist and I approached a few artists for books I really admired and uh, I, I realized I just couldn't afford them. That that was quite a stark realization. So obviously with any kind of project like this, there's going to be upfront costs. You know, the, the, the biggest ones are going to be really, I mean, really, I suppose it's editing. If you, if you pay for an editor and it, it's cover art, isn't it? Those are the, those are the biggies. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I ended up actually going on to Fiverr and trying to do find somebody mm. from a freelance point of view who could kind of do it at a, a cost I felt I could afford and justify as a, a newbie author. And um, so I ended up getting in touch and talking to quite a few different artists who were really keen to do it. Uh, but the one that I sort of just clicked with the best was a um, young woman called Anne Zedwick, who's also based in the States, actually. And, mm. um, yeah, we, we just sort of, said let's give it a try see if you like the initial designs and she kind of came up she came up with a color scheme first of all which i loved and the artwork which i hated and then there was a, a great bit of to and fro where so and that, that was really i really enjoyed that actually it was kind of it's very creative writing but it was just a, a different form of creativity trying to come up with a cover that kind of captured bits essence of what the book is about um but also it is some it also works as a book cover in its own right so yes yeah, sort of me and Anne kind of hit it off and uh yeah, she's um, obviously produced both covers so far, and she'll be working on Lost Gods later this year, basically. Yeah, it's really, really great covers. So I, it's great uh, that it. It sounds like you lucked out on, on Fiverr to find a, to find an artist that you work, that you clicked so well with. That's uh, that's good. It's tough because you don't really don't know where to start. There's so many of them. Yeah, and I think that's it. You know, that there's so many things where you've got you're, you're learning all the time with the, with this sort of stuff, independent. You know, I'm really glad I went onto social media when I did. I was late starting that side of things. But I learned an awful lot um, about the things I needed to think of. But yeah, I think cover art was probably my biggest concern going into it. Trying to find, I mean, I actually sort of worked on the basis of a price I could afford to walk away if that was if that felt the right decision. But actually, in the end, we, we just gelled and and so I think I think that's a, probably quite a good tip actually. Sort of you know commit. But if it doesn't work and it's not right, it's important to be able to not have sunk so much money into it. You don't feel like you can walk away. But yeah, you know, honestly, she, she put that she put that cover together in about a week. It was quite a, I was quite shocked actually, quite how fast she um, she turned it around. But yeah, I think they are they look different, and that, that's really what I was looking for. I, I kind of knew vaguely what kind of feel I wanted. Uh, that I want you know strong colours. I wanted you know to be able to read the title, but um, you know basic things like that that make sure the reader catches it catches the eye, but the, 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 the sort of you know the name of the author and the name of the title of the book sinks in um but yeah it's sort of like it kind of they, they just sort of slightly, slightly sets them apart so i'm really pleased with that side because it like i say it was a little bit of a leap into the unknown really yeah it's scary to 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 find an artist that you, you know, to find one that you clicked with that's that's really great so your for your self-publishing journey what was the biggest surprise what surprised you the most from that journey um lot, lots of things really um it surprised me. I think it surprised me to find out what you can learn to do if you put your mind to it. That's been quite um, quite eye opening because I was I'm a bit of a technophobe if I'm perfectly honest. So I wasn't uh, looking forward to things like websites. Um, I hated the experience of setting up my book on Amazon. That that really almost that almost broke me. So that there were bits that were quite hard, and I felt a lot of satisfaction at learning those skills and actually, you know you're holding the book. So clearly, <laughs> clearly it worked in the end, but it it didn't feel very easy. I think the other thing that probably surprised me the most is it, there, there is that online community mm -hmm. and it, that's very, very supportive. And um, I, I suppose when I set out, I kind of wondered, would I feel a bit like the outsider trying to get into the club? Whereas actually it's, it's got an open door policy, hasn't it, in, yeah. in reality? And, you know, people are incredibly supportive about you as a new writer. And I think um, there's a bit of, I mean, there's a bit of a psychological toing and froing with this exercise that is not always good for you i think it's fair to say you know this is not you know 
anyone in publishing, whether they're, you know, whether they're a traditionally published author or independent, you know, it definitely has highs and lows with this kind of business. And I think for me, it's kind of opened up the door to getting a support network of people who really understand what you're, what you're going through, the struggles you've got. I've got an incredibly supportive family and friends who, you know, 100% behind me and that, that's great, but they don't always necessarily quite understand um, what the challenges of some of this stuff are. It's very difficult to get that across, whereas the writer community really gets it. So I think, yeah, there were some challenges with it, but there was also, you know, it's been it's been much more rewarding doing this than I ever expected it to be. Hmm. And I felt, you know, for me, publishing that book at the beginning was all about the self-satisfaction of, you know, I'm getting a book that's available that anyone in the world can read and it can get in the hands of readers. That was the objective. But it, it became much more rewarding experience than that. And I think, yeah, that was a real, real eye opener. You know, one of the best things I've done, put it that way. Wow, that's great. And how how long has the idea for the book been in your brain? Been has, has it kind of been brewing for you? Has it been around for a while and just kind of mm -hmm. sitting there in the back? Quite, yeah, quite a while. Um, Twenty eleven was when the initial concept for Hall of Bones came into my mind. So that was before I'd read, um, for example, Game of Thrones. This is why the Farsi series is probably more important. Um, so I was kind of writing that book as I was picking up uh, George R. R. Martin's works later on and that was my reading and I think the two things then began to combine in my mind um but yeah it's uh these characters have been with me for quite a long time and, and the world building actually goes back to my previous attempt at writing a novel which actually began in 2000 and well probably the first knockings of that were 20, 2003 oh, wow. and then I kind of structured the initial I suppose that the mythology of the world and how that kind of comes together um that was kind of structured and worked through um, almost it basically it's background material really as I wrote my first novel which was I started in 2005 um, but that basically wasn't a very good novel which was a big, big bit of a problem um, so it didn't get um, accepted by um, agents and things like that because that, I was looking very much very serious at trad back then um, but although that that plot and structure didn't work I quite like the world I created and so I kind of scaff the, the scaffolding of Hall of Bones is a world um, was created in those early writings of the you know, 2005 to 2011. But then Hall of Bones, in terms of the first proper draft, and that was written over a sort of four-year period in 2011 to 2015. Um, so again, it's taken a long time to actually get it to um, sort of independent publishing, basically. It's taken a good few years, and I, I have revised it. So the 2015 version um, basically got not, not massively changed, but just tightened up before it came out in 2020. So yeah, I've been kind of working on and off with it for about 10 years, basically. Wow. So what finally made you decide to pursue it to get serious and say, I'm going to do what I can to make this happen? Was there a moment or was there something that happened that made you kind of push you over the edge? Um, <laughs> push over the edge is probably quite a good description, actually. Um, it's, I mean, I, I started out trad in terms of that that was the business model I was going with. So I've, I've got an agent. I'm represented by John Gerald, who you may or may, may not have, have heard of. So a UK um, literary agent, um, been, been in the business for, well, for a very long time, actually now, sort of 35 plus years. So yeah, basically I wrote that book and John took it on at, at the end of 2015. So Hall of Bones is the book that got me agented. And um, so obviously, obviously any kind of trad route, um, trying to explore that particular option it, it, it it's it's not a quick process so you know basically it was out to sub i then just worked started working on the sequels and the, the follow-ups to the books because that was the story i wanted to tell um but um yeah it kind of got to a point that you know a few years down the road where john and i were having a chat i'm sort of saying is it going to happen if it was going to happen would it not have already happened by now but there, there does come a point where a book gets past its its sell by date in terms of being you know hawked around um traditional publishers so for me i think the fact I was agented, I knew that book was a publishable quality. I wasn't just be published, publishing something purely out of vanity. And I just fundamentally wanted readers to read it. So John and I had a, a good chat and actually, John, you know, John was incredible. He's always been incredibly supportive. Very important part of actually making me a better writer. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we sort of said, OK, we'll give it a final shot with, with Trad. But it still wasn't any interest. So I said to John, and if that doesn't if that happens, I'll it doesn't happen rather. I'm going to go independent and, and get it released by then. And so we kind of did that with, with full agreement, really. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, fundamentally, it's about if you write a book, you don't write it just to, for no one to read it. So it, it, I didn't really feel like I had any option but to go independent in the end with that. Um, I'm still very interested in the trad trad route. I think there are, there are definitely pros and cons to the, 
the two different models you've got and i've actually got a separate book that's out to traditional um publisher submission now which is a different different set of characters um so same world different continent different set of characters so john's basically uh, approaching publishers with that right now and i'd still be very open to the idea of being traditionally published but um if if the answer from the traditional houses is no then my answer is going to be that book will be independent because i don't see any reason not to have that book in the hands of readers and obviously that ended up leading to um getting into the spiff bow finals so I, I you know i think that kind of for me justified justify the decision i took really so it's been quite a long route but i think in some ways that was quite a good thing because from 2015 onwards when i was working with john i was still writing and basically my craft improved so i do think in all honesty the book that we were sort of looking at sending to publishing houses in 2015 2016 it's not as good as the book you've got in your hands now because that book has been honed and improved further with another five years of, uh, of writing practice and craft really and you actually beat me to the punch because i was about to ask you about spiffbo and being a being a finalist what was that what was that like to be a finalist in such a prestigious competition it's just a bit bonkers really <laughs> um it's yeah i mean again it's been a it's been a great experience and again, i suppose a bit of confidence booster i won't i won't um i won't lie um it was quite tense just waiting for the outcome i mean I, you know in some ways you know it's it's awful if you kind of get cut first because you're sort of out within the first week of the competition starting and that that doesn't feel great but um for, for me it was kind of like semi-final announcement was only about three or four days before they then went in and the, the, my particular blog announced who the finalist was so I, I kind of was until it happened i was pretty much expecting to get cut i thought i might i thought I might get to a semi-final um, sticker spot that that seemed doable by the time it got to late october and i was still waiting to hear but yeah so it was a bit of a bit of a roller coaster <laughs> um it's it's quite a public well it is a public contest that's kind of the whole point isn't it? they want people to see your work but it did feel a bit um i suppose in the north you feel slightly exposed as well because obviously it's not just you know you're either in or out which is pretty you know binary but then obviously getting into the finals it's quite public in terms of, i've had some good reviews and i've had some less good reviews on that and that of course they're, they're splurged for all to see so that there's kind of an element of um why have i done <laughs> why have i done this to myself <laughs> what was i thinking but that that's kind of tempered with it's also led to some other great opportunities you know i've been on panels i've got to know the, the other contestants really well in the finals that that's been great fun um you know lots of interview opportunities things like that so it, it's it's definitely moved hall of bones up a level so I can I can see most definitely in terms of it was out for about a year before that finalist announcement was made. And, you know, it wasn't really registering. It was just running. It was literally under the radar. People, the odd person was picking it up. But it really, it just moved up a level as soon as Biffbo came out. And that, that's probably been, you know, one of the, be one of the benefits of it. Again, it, it getting, to, you know, it's independently published to get it into the hands of readers. So Biffbo has been brilliant to actually just, you know, making more people aware that i even exist i think that's been the biggest single benefit actually that people have a small a small group of people have started to hear that i'm a serious writer now uh, but yeah it's a proper roller coaster it's not this is what i'm saying you know with, with with any kind of with writing in particular you know as an author you do go through these enormous roller coasters of highs and lows you know, and it you know it was oh my god i'm gonna get cut oh I'm, I'm, i might do okay i'm in the finals array and then your review kind of experience is similarly similarly yeah. bumpy really so it's, it's an odd it's quite an odd experience in some respects yeah it must be really nerve-wracking to have to wait and then you know because you send the book in and then you have to wait and it, it's a lot of waiting it must be yeah and all the reviews now of course are stacking up big time so I've had, we've, we've had a few um you know um poor poor lauren mcgray hasn't had a single review <laughs> since she got into the finals so she's got off you know she's literally on that single score right now um and, and others have, have obviously kind of you know garnered you know four or five at this point it's going to be really the next kind of stealing myself you know march and april are going to be pretty intense and we're going to suddenly get this absolute avalanche of stuff coming at us yeah. so uh, you know we'll see what that leads to yeah wow and uh so uh when do you find time to write because i know that you you're involved in you have a, a day job of course so how do you balance your life and your writing time um it, it's probably changed i think the biggest single constraint is children actually mm -hmm. um so don't obviously when i'm talking about writing um you know 2003 2005 my, my children were really small so my at that point in my life my, my writing window was the evening um and then sort of slowly that 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 
that needle has changed. The kids have got older, you know, often they're out at night and I'm basically dad's taxi driving all over the place. So um, it, it switched around. So nowadays I'm primarily, um, I tend to write primarily in the mornings. Uh, so I do, I do some evening work on the on the book on probably on a Monday or Tuesday night it's quite good and then as the working week gets on and I get a bit more tired I flip over to doing things like your social media and um, stuff that just requires a bit less brain power and then I have a big push at the weekend when the teenagers are basically in bed and they can't get in the way so it has completely flipped round from being a night owl to being an early morning uh, early morning writer and that's so far has worked quite well trying to do that sort of, especially for Saturday morning get up early I try and always get at least a chapter work through or something done or a short story done or something like that that's kind of the objective is to make the most of those early morning starts really and after after being a, a finalist in spiffwood how did that change your approach did you feel a, extra pressure for the for the follow-ups after that after get it after getting so uh, yeah I, I did actually um i think it's uh so at that point so by the time i was fi- by the time i was sort of in the, sundered souls or, already been written and um that you know i i think actually Sundered Souls is a better book than Hall of Bones because I've had, you know, everyone that Hall of Bones is my debut. You definitely become a better writer with each and every book you write. Um, but I also think with with the third book I mentioned before, it was a it was a trilogy that's become four books. Um, I lost control a little bit of my material as I moved into that third book because I was chucking so many ideas at it. And I think um, I do know that if I just simply put out that there is a finished book, there is a finished third book, but put that out now, I don't think that is on, on a par with the previous two. So for me, I'll definitely will not release a book that I don't think is as good as the book that got me into the finals of Spiffbo, for example. Um, so um, yeah, there, there is a bit. I suppose there is a bit of a, a pressure to sort of maintain your output, and and I think also you, you learn again. You're learning more. So I look back. At, so basically, I I'm trying to think that lot that first version of Lost Gods, I probably finished about 2019. So this is the point where I just about got to the point where I was thinking trad's not going to happen for Hall of Bones. You're going to flip this. Try. So actually what I did was I parked the whole project. Um, I wrote a complete, this completely different novel just to give myself a bit of a mental break from it. And then I went back in and I've started to work my way back through the series and my back material, really. Um, and yeah, when I got to Lost Gods, I just thought this, this is definitely a weaker book than the others. It needs so much work. And so the, I've really been for the past, oh, I don't know, eight months or so. That, that's been the biggest battle, really, since Sundered Souls came out, trying to get Lost Gods into shape. And I suppose, yeah, trying to sort of, you know, yeah, there's a confidence boost with getting into the finals, but yeah, there's also a pressure that comes that kind of you've got to, you know, yeah, you know what you're doing, but you've also got to make sure that you don't sort of drop the ball at any point, especially in a series. You don't want to lose readers before they get to the end. So, um, yeah, Lost Gods is pro- it's probably the hardest book I've ever written, actually. It sounds a bit strange because you'd think by the third book in a series, you really know what you were doing. But that, that for me, I think is it's down to, yeah, I think with the benefit of hindsight, controlling material better, work out your plot better, and um, stop going off down rabbit holes all the time. I've cut so many bits out of that book and shredded it since I've started this latest set of edits. Um, it's coming at about 200,000 words. I think it needs to be around 150, which basically means I've written 50,000 words I didn't need to write, which looking back is not great for productivity, really, is it? So uh, it's it's a bit of a battle, actually. Yeah, and on and, and Hall of Bones, I love the prologue. It's it's one of those, because you... It, you know, I hear a lot about about get you know catching the reader's attention right away. That prologue, I wanted to know what happened. It really, it pulled me in. It was, it, I think it's not even a page; it's like three quarters of a page. But it it it, it caught me, and I wanted to know, uh, you know, why how we got to that point. Awesome, I'm glad it worked. Because yeah, a lot of people, of course, I didn't even realize until I kind of got onto social media. There's even a debate about whether you should have a prologue or not, and some re some readers will will like, skip them on principle. Um, and I thought, what? That's a terrible, <laughs> that's a terrible idea. I don't like the idea of that at all. Um, for me, that prologue is really important because I want to signal what this book is like. What I don't, because it, it is a bit sort of, you know, that first part is more about, I suppose, family, you know, relationships. You know, you want those. You hopefully you want to root for the characters it, it concerns. But I want to also signal to the reader in that prologue, it's a dark story, and I didn't want to ambush people with that halfway through the book if they haven't actually just got a taste of of maybe what's what's to come and in, in a way i i think with the benefit it, it kind of almost it alters the way you read those early chapters i think because you kind of know this but there's like this weight above you know that things are are good but you also know that they're going to a dark place and i suppose it, when it's waiting to see when that actually happens and why that i think is 
is part of why the structure of that for me, I think that the structure of that book works partly because of that prologue and that that sort of decision really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was great. I like I really loved it. And I also read that you were a big D and D player. Uh oh yeah, I, I was. Um yeah, I mean I, I was yeah, I'm a child of the 70s, so I was kind of, you know, born into an era where D&D &D was happening. It was a brand new thing when I was sort of growing up. Um, so, yeah, that, that kind of, looking back, I, I probably sort of, you know, seriously damaged my educational prospects with the amount of D&D &D I played. Um, but, yeah, it was a big part of my life in the 80s and, yeah, into the 90s, actually, as well, sort of, um, you know, playing those sort of early versions of those games. But I look at them now, they're really sophisticated I mean, you know, that the manual when I when I when I was a lad, when I, when I started playing, it was only about that big and you could sort of read it in an afternoon. It's like, exactly. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I want to go delve back into it now. It actually almost seems like it's too complicated. Back then it was um, it was a pretty free and easy kind of um, easy to pick up game. And uh, yeah, a lot of um, a lot of us spent an awful lot of our weekends basically not doing the things that our parents really thought we should be doing if i'm if i'm being totally honest with you uh, but yeah it was a it was a fun time actually again i think probably in reality that was probably the early parts of exploring storytelling you know mm. creative creativity imagination i did i was you know i did do dungeon mastering and get games running games but actually it wasn't my forte i preferred to play the characters actually mm. and that maybe that's sort of maybe that's why i'm a writer because i like characters and characters obviously are basically they're the cornerstone of writing a good book in, in my opinion so i think yeah dnd was kind of like a good training ground for the imagination but um yeah, i think uh, nowadays it's probably not probably not for me anymore yeah yeah I, i've looked into it but it seems really complicated so that's yeah kind of, i don't know <laughs> but yeah I, I was i was wondering how much that experience kind of shaped your storytelling and characters so that's um yeah because it is it is all imagination it's all in your you know it's role playing so mm. yeah trying to i can remember sort of trying to explain to people who didn't do it while i was doing uh, uh, there is a good proportion of society at the time that they when they unstilled it they just look at you like you're deranged yeah. and it when you stop and say, yeah well you know we, we just sit down with pieces of paper and you know we, we just pretend to be somebody totally different and obviously there are all these magical races and uh you know anything you know anything could happen at any time really that's down down to you and if you roll the wrong dice you die yeah. they, they, you say what uh, but at the time it's at the time it did seem it was a tremendous it was a tremendous release you know i mean i, I know it sounds a bit again making a we talked before didn't we, about sort of like you know real world events and how they kind of intrude upon how we want to relax. But I was in the 1980s was the era of the Cold War. Yeah. You know, as as kids, you know, we grew up in a period where, um, in many ways, you know, we were kind of expecting pretty terrible things to happen, and we, we you know that was talked about quite openly and freely and played out on the media. Or you know, and yeah, again, people wanted an escape, a bit like readings an escape. You know, for me, I think D and D was escape from school, which I didn't particularly enjoy studies which i wasn't particularly enthusiastic about uh, and uh, the wider world events that you know frankly didn't want to think about so again it was a it was a perfect release and you know it was, it was a huge part of my life you know like i say really throughout the 1980s really so in, in your mind what makes a good story um well as i think i said before i think character definitely definitely does uh, because i think a, a story can be beautifully plotted and i think plot again plot is important because it's the scaffolding that that, that tells the that, that, that the story is about and that, that i think is the weakness of a current book that's the that's the issue i've got to address but i think fundamentally the readers have got to engage with the character because it, it's the, the character the, the plot is what's happening the characters are why it matters mm. and you've got to get both of those elements right to actually kind of make something that i think a reader will engage with if they don't engage with the characters and i think that you know some people will hate hall of bones let's put it out there and they will hate hall of bones because they will bounce off that you know it's a it's a first person um primarily a first person perspective in terms of how the the, the world is perceived so that but that's that, that's a bit high stakes in some ways because if you don't like that central character you're really not going to like the book and that that might just close it down but i think primarily if you can create characters people want to can relate to um struggles that they can sort of um empathize with at the very least um that for me kind of all the rest of it is kind of a bit irrelevant whether there's a you know what i don't know what type of magic system for example there is it doesn't bother me in the slightest um it could be it could be high you know incredibly detailed sophisticated it could be almost you know non-existent like you see in some low fantasy books but it, it's all about that central premise of what's going to happen to this individual and do i care and i think if you do, if you care 
that's when a book works and then the rest of it is really just gravy and you mentioned a little bit about world building and i wondered how do you build a world what what is your process to to world building are there are there techniques that you use to help the reader understand the world that's uh, in the book yeah i mean there, there's more world than there is the, the, the reader experiences i've got a terrible memory um as everyone in my family would, would, would tell you so i have to write everything down if i don't you, that that world that piece of world knowledge is lost forever you know some people can hold stuff in their heads and it's uh you know for them it's quite easy but that isn't the case for me at all so um yeah I, I, again I, I find for me it's quite important to visualize the world first mm. um so whilst you know a good story is, is plot and character I, I think giving a reader a rich experience is making that world credible and believable so like i said i, I kind of effectively wrote a practice novel just to get the world and the mythology kind of pulled together and developed and then i've been tweaking that ever since but then yeah there's loads of um there's loads of background notes i mean i once wrote a history um for a, a planned novel um about a set of characters on a different continent and i've not used any of it yeah. <laughs> so fast there's about 40 pages of, of, of total um uh, total nonsense basically it, it's world building on a grand scale for an unused continent so uh, yeah i do build quite extensively mostly by note taking um you know, visualizing the web. maps for me are quite important. Not so much for, you know, I don't, don't, don't need a precise map when I write the story. I want a precise map by the time I've finished. So again, mm. I think the, the book, version of the book you've got, I think, should have the should have the map in the in the cover somewhere. It does yeah. Awesome, good. So that's printed result. Um, but yeah, so that that that's the one. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, possibly not bringing out such, but yeah, there, there's plenty of detail. <laughs> Plenty yeah. of detail there, and again, that that map plays a purpose because all of those, you know, all of those towns have got at least a loose um, history to them. Certainly, the certainly the clan lands have each of those individual clan lands, um, and for, for me, it kind of it, it just helps make brings the world to life, and it's uh, for, for the characters to have stakes that their actions have got to have meaning and. Part of what gives your actions meaning are go is going to be things like you know the world events. You know, obviously, all the bones is about. It, it's a partly a political novel. It's about one clan trying to get power over another and over the surrounding region. And I think what slightly surprised me as I was writing was I, I was having I was struggling to keep up with the plot myself because they were all sort of reacting in their own <laughs> their own kind of individual ways. Um, in terms of you know some clans were sort of you know trying to become remain neutral. You know, some were, were, were falling under the sway and becoming, you know, uh, joining with, um, with with the Voron clan, which is the main antagonist um, uh, people in, in the story. Um, and again, I think all that richness kind of came up because I'd done the world building first, because I knew who headed up each clan, where their alliances were and how they'd be tested when the when that sort of like um, sort of you know, the, the key events in the novel start to roll. And that kind of gave the novel much more life than I expected it to actually. So I think for me, yeah, for me, world building is really important, but there's definitely more out there than than gets on the page. I think that's the right way around, because for me, I want I only want to give the reader what's relevant. Every now and again, I might do a little bit of extra gloss just to kind of make it pop a bit. But fundamentally, I don't want to use stuff that's in there unless it has some sort of relevance to the plot, because I appreciate the reader's got to they've got to absorb quite a bit. Mm. You know, so I know I, I, 150 characters in Hall of Bones, that wasn't a good idea, looking back. I don't think any normal <laughs> publisher would have let me get away with that um, necessarily without some trimming. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I want uh, the readers got to absorb a fair amount of information, and I, so I wanted the world building to be relevant when they got it to make it feel, you know, like that they're experiencing a fantasy novel, but not, you know, pages and pages of all this all this stuff that they just don't need. You know, that's for me to to keep track of behind the scenes and use when it's uh, when it's relevant, really. And you had mentioned before about fantasy tropes that are that are reused, and it's there's staple there's some staple tropes in fantasy. But do you have any favorites that you enjoy, whether it's reading or writing about, like tropes that you that you like? Um, no, I won't, I'm not sure. I've really got. Um, I'm not sure. I really have to say I'd have a favorite. Um, I, I suppose I'm. I suppose with Rothko, I'm kind of inverting the chosen one kind of um, trope a little bit. It's, sometimes it's quite fun to invert. Um, invert those traps. I thought John Gwynn did that really well in um, uh, the Faithful and the Fallen series, which are again brilliant set of books. If you've if you've had a chance to read, yeah, I thoroughly recommend them if you, if you haven't. Um, 
where you know, particularly the, sort of the antagonist thinks they are the chosen one and thinks they're the hero, <laughs> hero of the story, and they're actually not. And uh, you know, it's, it's actually quite obvious to the reader from quite. I'm not sure you're right. I, I think you might be the bad guys here, and uh, it takes them about book three before they go. I am the bad guy, but I'm going to embrace it anyway. I, I think those are quite good. Where you're sort of that's you know, again, this is about going back to people want to experience a fantasy novel. They know what they want to get certain mm. things out of it, but they always want something fresh and new. And I thought John Gwynne did that really well. That's a great, great example for me of the, you know, the, the chosen one being subverted, really. Hmm. And who is your biggest supporter? Um, who is my biggest supporter? I think, yeah, lots, lots of people. Um, you know, my wife, Liz, absolutely. You know, she lets me spend an inordinate amount of time. Uh, writing 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 books um so yeah obviously i'd say my family would would, would be absolutely um up there um yeah I've, I've made some good friends through you know fellow writers that have supported me on, on different parts of, of the journey i mean i'd say you know give john jowell a shout out he's been great for helping he's been supportive because he's given me freedom um to do what i want to do but he's also been very good at saying you know this bit of your writing is good this bit you could work on. He's been very help, helpful at shaping my voice. So technically a, a great supporter and a, a fount of knowledge and wisdom, which is what you need. And then I say lots of writers that are kind of probably at a similar sort of stage in their careers to me. Um, we, we kind of, so I'd, I'd mentioned there, you know, I, I think there's um, Holly Tinsley has been incredibly supportive, fellow SB, uh, SPFO finalist. Um, I mentioned Crystal Matar in that as well. I mean, all the finalists have been really, really welcoming, but some of them I have known for longer and, you know, built up some, some sort of relationships and friendships that way. Um, P.L. Stewart, um, who's written the, the Drowned Kingdom saga. I think you spoke, have you interviewed him fairly recently? I'm trying to think, is that right? Yeah. Uh, we have yeah. a series starting soon. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, cool. He's, yeah, he's, um, yeah, he's the most positive person on Twitter, yeah. I think. Yeah. And um, yeah, he kind of motivates me, which is, which is good. You know, you need people that get it, but also maybe that you get different things from. Um, writers like Jacob Sanex, um, Sean Crow, I'm trying to think who, um, yeah, th 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 there's kind of like a bit of a game. Bjorn Larson, who I think is one of the most versatile writers I've ever read, actually, mm -hmm. whatever he turns his hand to is always different, but it's always brilliant. You know, it's a small group like that that's kind of come together that uh, just gives you enough of a critical mass to bounce ideas off. And, um, you know, I, I think just support each other a little bit, really. So, yeah, I think that I'd say that that group has kind of come to the fore and been, been incredibly supportive. Um, I'll give a shout out to Emily Penn as well, who's a fellow um, member of the John Gerald Literary um, Agency. So she's, um, uh, again, she's a sci-fi writer, but again, incredibly good at sort of drawing people together within the Twitter sphere in particular. And yeah, we've had, um, yeah, we've done some fun stuff together, actually, a few interviews and uh, mm -hmm. um, other sort of mu you know, musical side projects and all sorts of random stuff. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. It's so I didn't, I, I thought I was releasing a book in 2020 and I, I did do that but I think I also stumbled into this sort of like um bar of you know people that I thought might be a bit crazy and a bit you know cold shoulder but actually really really welcoming that that's been you know that group to kind of come to the fore the last couple of years to sort of uh, cement that really yeah. um yeah go with that go with those guys they're all great guys and you mentioned having teenagers have you have your kids read your books um my youngest doesn't really like the fantasy genre and sort of like simply says no dad it's just i'm not reading it and that, that's absolutely fine nothing wrong with that my, my eldest um has has had a read and um yeah you know she, she's she's more into into that kind of genre really so uh, I mean, it's kind of a bit weird isn't it i suppose if your dad gives you his book to read well, how, how do you react to that um so um yeah we'll, i think we'll have to see whether they sort of maintain any kind of interest but uh um but yeah, I got I got some I got some good feedback from my older such She gave me some a good a bit of um, useful critique on character development, which um, was actually spot on. <laughs> so she probably deserves a bit of writing credit for some of some of the elements of Hall of Bones. Actually, <laughs> was that was that nerve wracking for you when you when she was reading the book? Was you were you kind of nervous about what her reaction would be? Or yeah, well, like? I think anybody where you know them, it's yeah. always more it, the, the stakes are always high because I mean, you know you spent 10 years writing this it's appalling can you, can you imagine um you know because they obviously family sort of do tell it to you you know a lot more as it is don't they which, which is probably good um so yeah i did feel a little bit um a little bit of having said that i mean I've, so obviously people i know 
in real life. So my, my wife has done some test reading for me. A good friend of mine, um, Lawrence, has also uh, done the same. And actually, I, I know I will get an unvarnished view back. And that, that, that's really, really important. There's no point somebody reading your book critically and saying, this is great because there's always room for improvement and there's no, so you, you need that, you know, obviously don't destroy the author by giving them, you know, just, just shooting them down and telling them it's all for that. But if, if something doesn't work for, I always have a bit of a rule that if something didn't work for somebody in my sort of immediate test group, um, then, you know, I would think about it and decide what to do. And then I'd, I'd just forge on regardless or, or change it. If more than one person mentioned something didn't work for them, I, that was for me was a bit of a red flag that that definitely needed looking at. Uh, but it only works if they're being completely honest with you about what they actually think. So, um, um, yeah, so it's nerve wracking for a number of ways. It's nerve wracking because they know you and you want them to actually think what you're doing is worthwhile and not just lunacy. Um, but it's also um, it's also nerve wracking because actually you get feedback that, you know, might mean you've got to really think hard about the book, about what you're doing. So, uh, you know, this is why novels take such a long time to write, especially when you're starting out, because there is just so much to learn. You know, there's the technical yeah, there's so many technical acts of actually writing something on the page that people want to read, but then finding the the, the, the plot and the characters that they want to carry through to the end. You know, all those things are they're quite complex things, and you, you need, getting that feedback's really helpful to get those, you know, get those just right. And no matter what it is, uh, it's just the nature of the business. With whenever you create something, somebody's not going to connect with it somehow. So, what yeah. was that like to get negative feedback? Uh, what the um, negative feedback what, what was, was that a, an adjustment or how, what was that like uh what's it how do i put this or somebody's somebody's reaction is always going to be right mm. so uh, i think uh, i've recently put a, a bit of a blog together because I, i've been sort of like having a bit of an agony experience over oh my god how do you score books because i'm now i'm getting to know writers better uh, i mean i'm getting into this stage now we're actually we're you know, some of the people I know better have started to swap books, you know, arcs, those kind of things. We're kind of getting into that uh, that space. And uh, I'm quite happy to review, you know, it helps you discover new writers, isn't it? I'm happy to review that, review their work and so on as well. And then I thought, God, do I give this a, you know, can I give this five stars? Or what, what would I think if I give it four? And you kind of get into this slightly odd situation of, I suppose, scoring and grading art, grading art in a really sort of um, precise way when actually a novel's a really, really complex form of art. And yeah. the reason novels are really for complex form of art is because two people are involved in, in its um, experience. There's the writer who writes the novel and there's the reader who experiences it. And the thing that actually matters, it's the reader who experiences it. And this is why you get different scores, because one reader will take a book and will bounce, you know, bounce off Rothgar, the main character, because he's an idiot. So, you know, two stars. That's a perfectly legitimate response, because for that reader, that was their experience of reading the book. And you, you mustn't. It's very easy to say you can't take it personally. Obviously, I take it really personally because it's hard not to. But it, it's not they're not saying that about Tim Hardy. They're saying that about what they found in the pages. And that was their creative experience. Somebody else will take it and say it's a five star novel. It's absolutely brilliant. And, um, you know, it's fantastic. And both of those responses are totally legitimate. So. Yeah, I'm not, obviously I will not. I'm not delighted when somebody says I didn't enjoy re reading your book, or even worse, I, I don't like it when people just give it like one star with no reason. That's just like mean, isn't it? Um, at least tell me what. Give me the vitriol. Tell me why you think this book is terrible. I might even share that on social media because I can, you know, in some ways, bad reviews actually generate sales. It's not necessarily a bad thing because often what doesn't work for a reader is exactly what another reader is looking for. So, you know, if, you know, you don't like somebody said, I didn't like this, it was dark fantasy and I didn't, you know, two stars. Somebody else said, well, it's dark fantasy. I probably will quite enjoy that. I might go and have a look. If they simply score it without any kind of feedback, you, you haven't really got anything to, you haven't really got out, anything out of the experience for either of you, I think, in actual fact. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying really hard not to take it personally. Um, I am still quite new at this. I do sometimes take it really personally, but uh, that, that's not an invitation to score me really badly just to see whether you can make me cry or anything like that. But I understand why. I understand that, that you know, you can't see, not everyone's experience of a book is unique. And so you can't expect that, you know, that to reflect in all five star scores, you know, that, that that simply isn't the case. And I think if you're kind of pitching at the within three and four, you, you're doing something right. And, you know, I, I'd be quite happy with that, actually. 
Yeah, I know if, if I were ever to publish anything or even self publish, I would take it real personal. <laughs> so yeah. It, it must be really tough. And it's funny you mentioned about negative reviews because a lot of the times I'll look at a review and it'll be a two star. And just like you said, it, this is too dark. This is too violent. This is too, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, so I'll, I'll buy it because it's, I like those kind of stories. So even a negative review can, can be a positive thing for a book if it's, if there's yeah. some feedback behind it. I mean, some of them are hilarious. I mean, I, I do, I can't think, um, I'm trying to think of the example. I think um, it was Rob Hayes that I saw do it where he did about, he created a banner of re reviews for his, one of his books. And uh, I can't remember which one it was now, but on, on the, the left hand side, it was all, really, all, all positive. So it was a, like, you know, breakneck, you know, breakneck action and pace, for example. And then on the other side, there'd be somebody else review saying, you know, moved at a pedestrian pace, but, you know, I was bored with bored to tears. And thought, it's the same book. It can't, how can it have? How can that very measurable thing be different? But of course, it's different for individuals. So, um, yeah, I think you kind of got to embrace it in a way. You've got to kind of laugh, you've got to learn to laugh at it. You know, at the end of the day, you're putting something out there for the public consumption. The public are going to have an opinion on it, and you, you've simply got to to get to a place where you're comfortable with that. Otherwise, frankly, you're in the wrong business, really. And I know there are lots of authors that don't read their reviews for that reason. Um, I'm still at the point where, yeah, you've got a review. It's quite new. That's still quite exciting for me. So I do. I probably trawl it more regularly and more um, more keenly than I I, I should do. Um, so they, then you know, the, again, it's not that roller coaster, isn't it? Really, once more, you kind of get that experience of the highs of the five, the lows of the one, um, you know, or the indifference of the of the two of the three, for example, whatever you know, whatever people might mean by that, really. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of authors, in some ways, they think, you know what, I just need to find my audience. It doesn't really matter what you as an individual think. I'm going to find my audience write what I want to write and it'll appeal to that group and that's absolutely fine. And the fact it doesn't appeal to everybody is also absolutely fine. I, I'm, to be honest, I probably need to get to that place. I probably need to stop sweating this stuff quite so much, but it's just still the, the, the novelty factor is still a bit too um, bit too strong. I'm only sort of 18 months into this at the moment. So it's uh, it's um, it's, a, it's good advice I'm not following, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's tough. I'm, I'm, I bet it. I, I don't know if I could. It would be a lot for me too. So I can definitely see where you're coming from. And uh, something that always intrigues me is how different authors, if if they listen to music while they write, do you listen to music when you write? Um, no, I don't. Um, I mentioned Emily Inkpen before, and we actually we pulled together some author playlists, mm. uh, which we put out sort of via Twitter. This is probably going back about. Um, Oh, about a year or well, it's been getting going on for about a year. We I think we put the last one out for a, as a Christmas playlist to kind of wrap the whole thing up, um, basically. Um, so yeah, I know a lot of writers find it really helpful to get in the mood, um, or to, to sort of like channel a particular particular tone they're trying to get. I, I just find that music swamps my sort of create all I get is the music. I can't possibly write and have that kind of interference going on in my brain. But I did I I get why other people want that kind of prop to help them write. So yeah, it was quite good fun actually picking tracks and things for um, uh, for Emily. It was the Inkwalker um, Collective. If you search on Twitter, it brings up a few a few randos. So, yeah, you've got my some of my musical tastes coming through in, in that with a, quite a few other authors actually. It was a quite a big collaborative project in it so when it first kicked off. Um, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, some people find it helpful. I, I personally, I don't mind a bit of background noise. You know, in the world before COVID, writing cafes and things was sometimes quite for me it was quite a good technique because you just um i don't find it works very well writing in my office now which i where i'm sitting here now doing this recording is my office i use for work uh, which is fine but i find it very difficult to write here i actually prefer to write in the hub of the house and just be aware of what's going on even if i'm concentrating on something so for me it's more uh, definitely not music but a bit of background noise seems whatever reason just to make the creative juices work a bit uh, a bit better hmm. uh, what is do you have a favorite album that you will never get tired of um god i suppose it depends a little bit on um on mood actually I, i'm i'm quite um quite eclectic in my sort of musical musical tastes so i've recently for example i've, I've rediscovered the pet shop boys which again again this is this is showing my age and sort of like 80s uh, music and all the rest of it for a long time i hadn't listened to them i've gone back through their sort of back catalogue and into their the early 2000s so um you know they're they're kind of a you know they're kind of a band that's sort of like again they've been completely it doesn't really matter what the musical trends have been <laughs> throughout all of all the sort of 30 30 or nearly 40 years they've been recording 
um, it kind of keeps uh, they keep putting out their output in the way they want. And again, I think that's a good a good sort of lesson for creatives actually. Um, other music that I've really hard to think off the top of my head. What um, what else I've been? Uh, yeah, I pretty I, I pretty much listen to anything. I'm um, probably only class, classical music is a bit of a blind blind alley for me. I've never really clicked with that. But anything in the rock pop kind of um, world is yeah I enjoy. But I'm not really one for I'm not really a big one for lists and sort of saying this is the these are my top ten albums of all time. You know you might ask me that in February and I have a view. It'll probably be completely different in March. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. It, my list was always different whenever someone else, someone asks, it's always different. But uh, we did have a question from the previously mentioned P.L. Stewart. Oh, yeah. And, and he would like to know uh, how you feel about being the favorite author of the incredible blogger uh, Under the Radar SFF, SFF books. So, uh, Blaze. Yeah. Um, how does it feel? It feels really bizarre. <laughs> I think it's, I mean, it's you need people to help you, I think, is the bottom line. You know, you, you can't. I think, again, I thought I could release a book and people would pick it up by word of mouth and it would get, um, it would just slowly get traction. And then I realized that actually the only way it gets word of mouth is by you telling people it exists. And so you need the help of the book blogging community, you know, people, you know, people like you, um, to actually just help raise that awareness and make people aware that these, these things are actually out there. And, um, so yeah, I sort of released my book into the void and went, oh, wait a minute. What I probably should have done here is let people know and given these, given out advanced reader copies and actually told people this was coming. Um, so I then kind of reversed that strategy pretty rapidly of not doing that and instead started doing that. And Blaze was one of the very first people that picked up on the series. Mm. Um, and again, it was at the time, it was just really important that somebody liked it. You know, it get you know, was I wasting my time? Well, had it been a big mistake? And, you know, somebody sort of saying, I really like this series. I really, really enjoy it. it this is, and then, yeah, I think Blaze put it in his um, top books of um, uh, of last year, which, which absolutely blew me away. When I think of all the different books that people have put out, for somebody to say, you know what, of all the books I read in the past 12 months, this was what in my top 10. Um, yeah, it, I was I was made up by that, if I'm, if I'm honest with you, because you, there's an awful lot of times when, you know, you know, Amazon, you know, obviously being independently published, you know exactly how many books you're selling and how many pages people are reading. And there were dark days when that number was nil. You know, mm. and I'm not joking. That number was literally nil sales, nil pages read on Kindle Unlimited and all the rest of it. It's just that, am I absolutely, have my family been really polite? All those test readings they've done for me. to actually go and say, he can't write, can't write for toffee, he's terrible. Um, so somebody like Blaze coming up and saying, yeah, you're all right, you, you, you've done a good book, I've really, really enjoyed it. And then to actually put it in that top 10, it it just keeps you going. Mm. You know, you, you, and again, it, 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 like I said, it, well, as I mentioned, it's like a roller coaster, but it's more a roller, for me, it's been more of a roller coaster, but every time you, you're going up higher each time and then you drip down, drop back down and then you go higher again. And that it's those sort of moments when somebody says that, it helps gather that momentum again for that next kind of kind of push up. Um, mm. I, can, I can sort of remember Blaze messaging me sort of privately saying, you are entering Spiffo, aren't you? I thought, I think I am, but I'm slightly <laughs> slightly <laughs> nervous about doing it and I might bottle it at the last moment. And um, it, yeah, those little words of encouragement are actually what make the difference sometimes between somebody being creative but not quite having the courage of their convictions and actually them <laughs> saying, you know, yeah, actually, this is good and you, you need to be telling people about this. So, yeah, you know, for me, it's... Uh, it's a great question by, by PL because you know Blaze is a great he's he's shone a light on an awful lot of good books and um, you know he likes his mainstream doesn't he but he also very supportive of indie as well uh, alongside and I think these days he's swinging much more towards actually indie being the his preferred form of reading and you know having some of that kind of growing platform supporting you yeah, it just makes a massive massive difference so yeah for anyone listening or watching this you know Get your marketing strategy right and talk to bloggers well before you start releasing books. It's uh, it'll, it pays massive dividends, really. Yeah, and from a self-publishing standpoint, it almost feels like writing the book is just the beginning because then you have to market it mm. and you have to. Get it out. That sounds like a lot of work, a lot of planning. So it sounds almost a little daunting when you uh, just yeah. from the outside in. Yeah, I mean, I, I went in completely ignorant. <laughs> I, I mean, I thought I knew roughly what I was doing. I, I, I think all I. I think like I said, my, my focus was first of all just on the sheer technicality of how on earth do you release a book? You know, how do I format this thing to make it do this? And 
why does Kindle create not work? And you know, all these sort of like heartfelt screams into the into the void, but no one can help you. No one can no one can do it for you. You've got to figure it all out. So yeah, I'm not, and obviously that, that's the bedrock, isn't it? If you've got a, any you, anyone's entitled to self-publish, they can write whatever they like, whatever quality that you know that ple that pleases them. Like I said before, somebody's five stars, another person's one star bounce straight off, isn't it? Um but yeah, it's so obviously from my point of view, for your audience, writing the best possible book is obviously the bedrock. But it that that is only the start. You're absolutely right. Actually, the, the, the biggest single battle of any author, but I think particularly independence, is actually finding readers. And, you know, I, I think I've written a good book. It's got into Spiffbo finals, and there's a bit of element of luck in that. But I think also it's a good book. You know, good. you only get into the finals by, by being good. You might not. It doesn't mean that all the books didn't get into the finals were bad books. It just means there was that element of luck where I, I locked out. But, you know, that was a book that basically no one was reading before Smith Bow, if I'm perfectly honest with you, it was tiny, tiny dribs and drabs that was very, very slowly going up. And then, like you say, like I said before, Smith Bow kind of helped me level up a little bit and then you find a, a slightly wider reader base. But it's, I think for a lot of authors, marketing doesn't come naturally. And I think even using the term marketing is quite loaded for some people. Because um, I think a lot of people think that marketing is a bit like the door to door salesman selling you the vacuum cleaner that you don't actually need. With all the attachments that you sell as extra that you don't actually want or, or or have anywhere to store in your cupboard, never mind have any practical use in your house day to day. Whereas actually, I think marketing it's it's about finding readers that want to read your book. There is no point me shoving my book down your throat if you don't like it and me forcing you to buy it because what you might you might all you might do is give it a one star review on Amazon at the end of the day. What you actually want is to engage with people. And I think if you flip it around and think of it like that. It becomes a bit less daunting because all you're really trying to do is you know make yourself known i think being supportive is quite useful as well in, from that point of view because you know you, you get paid back tenfold for every support you give to one one particular author i found it always comes back and it, it just helps you go on and it helps that that conversation starts that that you know that word of mouth thing that you actually need so yeah it's not i don't think i've ever bought i don't think i've ever bought a book based purely on a, a sassy ad. Uh, I, I bought a book based upon feeling like I know the author or know what the author stands for, what the, the type of writing they do. And it's that kind of becoming known and being part of the conversation. If you turn it into that, it, it's a lot less, um, it, it's a bit more natural, I suppose, really. And a bit less uh, a bit less business orientated in, you know, industrial scale. You know, it, it just, it, they're not the type of thing that you can just, you know, throw at anybody and expect them to enjoy it, really. Yeah. And it, it's also a time investment too. So it's, um, it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's tough to, to do that, but it, you're right. I think even, uh, I think getting over that feeling like a door to door salesman is, is tough to get over that, that hump of, cause with no experience in marketing or kind of getting, even just getting the word out. Yeah. It's, it, uh, you know, it can, it's intimidating. Yeah. I think if you basically look back at everything I was doing in 2020, don't do that. And that that's a great start in terms of marketing, uh, marketing knowledge. I think you, it's not cynical. It, it it's that there's obviously a business element to it, but ultimately you're kind of selling yourself a little bit. I think that that's what I had to kind of get more comfortable with. I thought the book would sell itself, and actually that is not the case. That is not the case. You you have to you know any author that's got a decent social media presence and got decent sales that they've got that entirely down to hard work no matter what you think about them as a writer and whether you want to read their stuff every single one of them has earned their place absolutely and that's it's no different for anybody else coming in new so you've got to start you know you've got to embrace that side if you if you're happy to release a book and put on to read it i suppose you know that that is your prerogative isn't it <laughs> and, you know people can that that's an option but uh for, for me I, I want people that enjoy this sort of stuff to find it and read it so I, i've had to sort of embrace that really over the past 18 months and get you know, doing stuff like this i wouldn't have dreamed of doing something like this two or three years ago i, mm. I really would have found it actually almost intimidating to the point of wanting to hide under the bed covers i really would um <laughs> so yes you know, you're you're a very welcoming host and i don't feel at all um, at all intimidated but that's because i've changed as a person in in the intervening period and sort of like started to embrace these things and then half the time they're not nearly as bad as you think they're going to be yeah. you know a lot of people think well i can't do this i can't do that well actually you know getting into this kind of world it, you, you find you've, you've got a lot more skills and um you know resilience and, and aptitude for things and i think sometimes we give ourselves credit for 
Yeah, especially for from my you know because I'm I'm just a reader. I just enjoy the the book. So whenever I get to talk to authors, it's it's kind of like talking to uh, like rock stars. So it's a treat for you know when you when you're invited, it's because we you know we enjoy your work and want to learn more about you. So cool. It's good that you feel more comfortable about that. And is there anything that your readers would be surprised to learn about you? Um, what would they be surprised to learn about me? I think, I don't know, maybe they'd be surprised to learn how little I do research. Um, you know, I, I take, um, I think I, I'm very keen to not be perceived as somebody that, so this is Viking inspired fantasy. This is not um, a Norse inspired fantasy. So I've taken the, some of the culture and some of the trappings and, you know, um, sort of world building view, to sort of create a theme, a feel for the book and a theme for the book. Um, but I'm not an expert in Norse mythology or anything like that. So um, I basically, uh, my, my view is write the book and, and try not to let history get in, get in the way. So um, for, for me, you know, research was, you know, I used the, there's a website called Viking Answer Lady, um, which is basically a lady that answers <laughs> Viking questions. <laughs> and I thought, this is the perfect website for my absolutely amateurish level of um, commitment to, to historical research. So, um, you know, names and things like that are drawn from some of the resources um, on, on her website that helped give me, a, again, give me a sort of feel for naming conventions and, and those sort of things. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty much focused entirely on the story. I don't really spend an awful lot of time trying to do, I spend more time looking up whether it's lying or lay in terms of some of those author traps than I ever do in terms of, uh, in terms of sort of technical um, research, really. So yeah, I don't know if that's uh, an interesting fact, but uh, that's one thing that, that marks me out, maybe. Yeah, for for aspiring authors out there who want to write who want to write a Viking inspired, to go visit that website. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's all you need. Honestly, you don't you don't you know put those books away. <laughs> you, yeah. you don't you, you don't need them at all. Yeah, so I, I do have a couple more questions for you. Um, I know that you watched the, or you listen, I think you listened to the, the Halo Scott conversation I had. Yes, I did. So, uh, for, so jelly beans, if you eat them all at once, or if you uh, pick them out flavor by flavor? It has to be flavor by flavor, because anything else is just anarchy, isn't it, really? You, you know, you're not actually getting, you're not experiencing, you're, all you're getting is a massive sugar rush and a, a flavor confusion. Why would you, you know, I, why would you not, you know, corral them into their their, their relevant colour constituent parts? Anything else is just madness. <laughs> okay, good. I'm not alone. Uh, and yeah, then... no, you're you're right. In fact, it's not it's not alone. You're you're correct. Okay. Confirmation, confirmed. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you have a a favourite family recipe? Um, favourite family recipe. God. Um. I'm guessing from the the, the the pause that's coming out here that the, probably the answer to this is no. Um, I, do, I suppose we, we actually we, we our house is rammed full of cookbooks of all all shapes and sizes. So um, we, we try, I think one of the one of the things about sort of again probably the COVID pandemic and being stuck in the house was you know actually cooking and, and food became more important to us and actually you know trying to eat trying to eat healthy those sort of things we get a lot you know we get a lot of you know fresh fruit and vegetables and things that delivered to our house and we always try and then um kind of create something new so i think in many ways probably we're more trying something out for the first time is perhaps more fun than uh, the, the, the tried and tested um mm. so far um so yeah I, i'm not sure we've got anything that would say that is the go-to recipe we have every every week you know we, we pretty much eat um eat anything going really mm. that's interesting so uh it you know it's really it's interesting the way that the pandemic affected everyone differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so, some people went the opposite way and just ate a bunch of junk food. And <laughs> well, that, that I'm not saying we ate exclusively. We, we, um, you know, takeaways have entered the Hardy household. So you know that that was also a, a key survival strategy. But you know, it's um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, from my point of view, it just uh, anything that kind of helps draw the family together. You know, and food. Food is one of those things, you know. We, you know, we try and eat together as a family. Those kind of things. It might be in front of the TV. Nothing wrong with doing that either. Um, but um, yeah, it's uh, you know, food's an important part, especially with teenagers who just like eat 
phenomenal amounts of food anyway you know this is our that family meal at the end of the day is the one chance to chuck a vegetable at yeah. them and hope it sticks basically yeah, I have a 16-year-old son, and I, I miss I start to miss those days when I can just eat and eat and eat and not get any weight. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, it, it's just cruel. You, you watch them do this and think, why? They don't. The thing that frustrates me, they don't even appreciate it, do they? No. They have no. This is a gift from God Himself, and they have no idea that these days will come to an end. And all of a sudden, you'll be thinking to yourself, those elasticated trousers. I'm actually up for them because that that actually is what I need right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I look at it. I look at food now, and I get I get a little fatter. So it's it's tough. It, yeah, it's I, not easy. It's middle age, but you know, it's, it, unfortunately, it creeps up on all of us. So you know, we just need to embrace it, don't we? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> and if you were in the uh, Brotherhood of the Eagle series, would you survive? No. 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 It's too. No. I, I mean, I. I no. <laughs> <laughs> on every level i'd be political i mean I'm, I'm you know although it's quite sort of there's lots of political intrigue i wouldn't notice what was going on around me i'd get stabbed and offed if i was in the way straight away but i think to be honest with you i'm not exactly you know obviously the worry that the brotherhood of the eagles kind of built around this slightly macho insane warrior culture that mm. you know ev everyone that's in that warrior culture thinks it's awesome but a, actually, what it's meant is that they're kind of fairly unprepared for the, the challenge that the novel actually and the series actually throws at them because they they sort of pursued, you know, force of arms over, you know, the, the, the magical kind of skills that other, other enemies are basically embraced. Um, but also it just means that, you know, only certain people of a certain physique are going to kind of rise to the top in that kind of culture. That That is not me. So, you know, I would be, you know, I, I'd be in the field somewhere sort of like, plucking turnips or something like that so whether i survive or not you know tim hardy's not going to feature as a major part of that novel because of that because of that um, culture really i think I've, I've created a culture i couldn't thrive in myself yeah that's that's that's, that's fun though right <laughs> you want to create worlds that you you know yeah i mean i suppose that's right it's kind of um that, that's why we write fantasy because we, we kind of you know it gives you great gives you tremendous freedom to do whatever you actually want to do and yeah. uh, you know you can kind of really, you can really go there as well. You can sort of build on an idea and sort of double down on it without uh, without fear or favour, really. But yeah, I'm, I'm basically turnip field surf kind of person. Uh, I suspect that's would be that would be my lot in life with a weak chest. Yeah, I think I'd be there with you, turn, pulling turnips. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so the just a couple more. Um, so, what was your first job? A hey, first job. Um, I suppose. What very first time I earned money, or pr first proper job, or, or do you want my prospect to talk about both? I mean, I, I did odds of bits and pieces. I think my very first job where I got cash in hand, or that was working for a family member, was gardening. So um, uh, my aunt and uncle had a big house with a particularly big garden that they wanted me to weed for them. So I remember there was a couple of years where I sort of like got a bit of cash in hand just for help them keep on top of that, you know, waiting jobs those sort of things um i think my first proper job so i've got i've got a legal background um that's kind of where i started out i've worked for um what was it a law costs law cost draftsman company which sounds incredibly exciting but i'll make it sound more boring um basically they, this was a, a company that would take the the files of law firms um this was working in manchester back in the back in the day and um you would basically take those files work out how many letters had been written, how many um, phone calls had been made, meetings that happened, and you'd work out how much they should charge their clients. And uh, my job wasn't to do that bit. My job was to tidy up the file <laughs> before it got given to somebody who knew what they were doing. Um, and then basically I was the, I used to, this is a, uh, this is all after I got a degree, by the way, in law. So it wasn't a great time to come out and <laughs> sort of, uh, uh, I came out in the middle of quite a big recession within the in the UK in the 1990s when I finished my, my university education, and um, so yeah, I had a basically a job of, of paper paper shuffling, and um, you know going around Manchester law firms basically to the back the back door, not the front door, the back door where I would return files to to law firms and um, you know get them get them circulated. Which it was a it was a dull job. It was the first job where I sort of got a pay check out of it at the end of the day and thought that's all right i can actually live on this this is this is okay so um in a second just been messaged here um 
so yeah that, that, that was that, that was the first proper job where i suppose i was paying tax that's another way of looking at it so uh and then yeah kind of went went up there but yeah law costs draft trainee law cost draftsman in manchester um i was a basically a man with a sack full of case files walking around manchester which was a bit bit of a bit of a strange image when you stop and think about it now yeah but it was a learning experience though i mean but it was uh now that you, of course you've uh you know moved up and now you can you know what those people are dealing with now too so you understand more of the system and... oh yeah you're right actually because you know as you you literally you'd need to sort it out and date order remove duplicates that sort of thing you had to you had to skim the contents of what you were what you were looking at just to understand just to remove duplication apart from anything else so you're right actually there was i think with all jobs you, you do you're always learning you're always learning something whether in the you know service you know back office like that 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 one was or you know working with clients and advising them which is what my, my job ultimately became later on um and th there's nothing wrong with um doing you know starting at the bottom working your way up there's nothing wrong with that at all in many ways you learn a lot more by doing it yeah exactly so something I, I try and ask all of my guests just because i like to improve my questions and things like that my process if roles were reversed and you were in my position was there a question that you would have asked that i did not ask uh, yeah i knew this question was coming but I obviously didn't know what you would ask. Uh, and now you've asked a few questions. I can't think of anything you've not um, you've not covered really. I, I was quite keen to kind of get, I think, get out the the kind of um, the roller coaster side of this for, for people that are looking at um, you know looking at looking at authors and, and that kind of wanted to go there. And I think just to understand what it what it entails, but also that there's support out there. So I think from I think for me it's been quite useful useful conversation sort of bring that out no i don't think there's anything you've you've not covered that um i really wanted you to um, oh, okay. i know you asked me before didn't you did you have any topics and i came up with a big fat zero so uh, i guess uh, i guess it does it's the lack of research coming through again i just don't really know what i'm doing or what i'm trying to achieve when it comes to this so um it's yeah, all it's all random it's all random and chaos <laughs> That makes two of us. So I have no idea what I'm doing, but that's a lot of fine. Them... You're, doing, you're doing a great job of not knowing what you're doing. So that, that's awesome. It's a, it's a fake it till you make it kind of situation. So we'll see what happens, but I, I know you're really busy. Uh, so I want to thank you for taking the time to chat with me. I know you have books to write and you have family and work and everything else. So thank you for taking some time out of your day. And if anyone wants to connect with you or is the best place to find you? Um, okay. Well, I've got uh, a website, which is, um, Tim Hardy, um, author, um, dot co dot uk so that's um, sort of like central hub where i keep all the core information so um we've got all my social media media links on there uh, i'm primarily on twitter and well I say primarily i'm only i'm only on twitter and facebook um uh, at the moment i'm not not thinking of going too much further in terms of social media really so twitter handle is tim hardy author um and uh, it's the same for uh, facebook as well uh, i've actually got two accounts so i've kind of got currently the i've got um an author account um, but then I've also got, I suppose, an official author account. At some point, I might lock one down and just work work with the other. But there's basically, if you search Tim Hardy author, you can hit either of those, and um, that they'll again connect me on one of those on Facebook. That that would also be fine. So, uh, uh, yeah, th those are the those are the places where I lurk. Cool. And I'll be sure and add all those links in the description on YouTube or on the podcast, so everyone can can go and cool. find you. And enjoy. So thanks again. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on. It's been, been good fun. Cheers, Steve. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Nice to see you.